Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast, conversations with today's top ministry leaders to help you lead better every day. And now podcasting from scenic Colorado Springs, Colorado, here's your host, Jason Day. Hello, and welcome to another insightful episode of the Church Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Day, and our conversation this week is one every pastor and ministry leader can benefit from because I had the chance to talk with Charles Stone on the topic of mindfulness from a Christian perspective. Charles is the senior pastor of West Park Church in London, Ontario, Canada. He's the founder of Stonewell Ministries. He's an avid learner and researcher, as you will hear, and he's a contributor to publications such as Outreach Magazine, SermonCentral.com, ChurchLeaders.com, as well as many others. Charles has written several books, including his latest, entitled Holy Noticing, The Bible, Your Brain, and The Mindful Space Between Moments. On this week's episode, Charles and I discuss the intersection of neuroscience and biblical truth, highlighting the importance of holy noticing, which is a spiritual discipline that has been practiced by Christ followers since the first century. Charles shares why this is key to leading well, and we explore how science has caught up with scripture, improving the power of practicing a mindful lifestyle that leads us to engaging the world around us like Christ. It's such a fascinating conversation with practical implications. So please, won't you join me in my conversation with Charles Stone? Charles, welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast. I am so glad that you could join us this week, brother. Great to be with you, Jason. Good to be good to be here today. Yeah. Now, Charles, we see, we hear, we read so much about this idea of mindfulness. I mean, it has really become a hot topic, incredibly popular, and personally. I know some people uh, within the church who embrace it. Um, I know others who are kind of concerned that maybe in some way it's outside of of Orthodox Christian practice, uh, maybe even worse. Um, People have different thoughts and opinions. You have done a lot of research in this area, and uh, you have recently released a book uh, that addresses this subject entitled Holy Noticing. Charles, where do you believe we should kind of land when it comes to this idea of mindfulness? How does it, how does it connect to, to our life and our journey with Jesus? Well, uh, perhaps just a bit of background, why I actually uh, decided to write this book. Um, I love learning. Uh, I have for many, many years practiced all the spiritual disciplines, Bible reading, Bible study, scripture, memory, fasting, uh, all those kinds of things. But in my life personally, I still found myself as a leader getting defensive in meetings, finding myself being anxious, overly anxious about issues in the church. And so I began to ask myself, and there's also a personal story about my daughter in this as well, but I began to ask myself, is there a piece that I'm missing this whole spiritual formation thing that is affecting my ability to lead well? Well, it just so happened that entered into a degree program on the neuroscience of leadership, taught by a neuroscientist, and I did my final uh, thesis um, of this master's program, executive master's program, on mindfulness for leaders. So I just immersed myself in this, read probably, I don't know, a couple hundred books, uh, papers in full or in part, which led to this uh, book because most Unfortunately, most of the resources you find out there are from a Buddhist background or mm-hmm. totally secular. Very little for the evangelical a person with the evangelical mindset. So that's kind of in a nutshell what led me to it and why it's so important. I think it's profoundly influential in our spiritual formation and in our leadership as well. Excellent. Now, Charles, what I love, I love the fact that uh, this came out of your own hunger for learning. And kind of this journey that God took you as you really dug in, you you got into this program, you've, you know, the whole neuroscience side of it. It wasn't you just, you know, sitting out on a mountain peak somewhere in the beauty of all and saying, okay, let me, let me get into this mindfulness. But there's, there is this very academic side to your research and your study. But as we, as we read in the book, there's also this very practical, like, um, spiritual formation side. So, so you're able to bring both, um, as a pastor for many, many years, you're able to bring both the academic side to it, you know, the science side of it, but also the very, you know, heartfelt follower of Jesus aspect to mindfulness. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how those two pieces really kind of come together? Yeah. Well, I'm, I am admittedly a geek. <laughs> I, <laughs> 
I love to learn. Uh, I, I guess if I could say I had a hobby, it would, would be learning. So I've always kind of had this kind of nerdy approach. Uh, and so that's been, you know, strength God gave me. But the personal side, God has often had to take me through broken experiences mm-hmm. to soften that part of me. And actually, the visceral part of behind my writing on this actually started in a high chair over 30 years ago. Now, I was not in the high chair, but rather <laughs> my daughter, my youngest daughter, Tiffany, was in the high chair, a year old in Laurel, Mississippi. I had, uh, I was feeding her that morning, period, peaches or something. It was Christmas morning, and I noticed her left eye quivering. Now, you've got kids, and right. you see something like that, and you're preschoolers, you think, this is not good. So a few days later, I went to the doctor. He said, it's probably a true business, something she'll grow out of. But when you go back to Atlanta, we were in Atlanta at the time, you might want to have a specialist check it. Went to see a specialist back in Atlanta. He said, oh, it's probably a true business, but let's do a scan anyway. So a couple of days later, got a scan, drove home. On the way home, or actually after we arrived, opened the front door, phone was ringing, ran into the kitchen, picked up the receiver, and it was the doctor. He said, Mr. Stone, we have the results from the CAT scan. I said, okay. He said, your daughter has a lesion on her brain. I thought, a lesion? That's just like a sore, you know, takes a man about it, goes away. And then he said something that profoundly shook our world. He said, Mr. Stone, your daughter Tiffany has a brain tumor. Oh, my. All right. Now, little one-year-old girls aren't supposed to get brain tumors. Well, for the next 28, 29 years, we lived in this world of neurology. She had a dozen brain surgeries. She had devices put into her body, a device put into her brain that was experimental, part of her brain removed. So all of this experience of real brokenness made me look deep inside and ask some of these deep questions. And so you have this personal side of my whole life and my desire to you know, follow Jesus with this kind of interest in science that all merged together. So there's a very visceral experience of life that prompted my uh, hopefully bringing this conversation of mindfulness into leaders' lives and into Christians' lives. So I I can still even feel some of those experiences with Tiffany. She's doing well by now, uh, pretty well right now as well. She's going to seminary herself to be a chaplain. Awesome. Awesome. That's that's excellent. Now, brother, the the whole idea of uh, you refer to mindfulness as this idea of holy noticing. Mm-hmm. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what do you mean by that? You know, what is it? What is it not? Well, mindfulness, as it is usually used, uh, and it's translated. The, the word in popular use is from a word from the Pali language, uh, but mindfulness, as I defined it, is a word translated from the Hebrew language, which preceded the Pali language. Mm. So the Hebrew scriptures preceded uh, the Buddha's writings and all that sort of thing. So we have this historical precedence of this contemplative. In fact, the key word is called zakar in uh, in Hebrew. It means con- contemplation, to remember, to be still, That all those kind of uh, words would describe it. So what I've done is I've combined scripture. Uh, Luke 2.52 was one of the scriptures I used when my life verses. I combined that with some evidence-based research, and I've come up with a definition called holy noticing, which is this. Noticing with a holy purpose, God in his handiwork, our relationships, and our inner world of thoughts and feelings. So it's really, Jason, it's, it's a posture that we as leaders and as Christians take more, hopefully more often than not, on a moment-by-moment moment basis, so that we are present, fully present in the moment, noticing what is where God has placed me and who he's placed me around, and my inner world, not trying to push to get to a next better moment, which we're, when we're in the thick of stress, in the, in the thick of difficulty, we don't like where we are, so our tendency is, I want to get beyond this moment, I want to get to another one. Rather, mindfulness, or holy noticing, is learning to be present in that moment, noticing it with a holy purpose. So that's kind of a little bit of wrapping around uh, the de- the definition of holy noticing. Yeah, that's good. Now, uh, one of the things that, that you make clear in the book, because again, when we look at kind of popular opinion and culture and a lot of, a lot of the books that are available, a lot of kind of the self-help and, and a lot of the books even uh, along the lines of, of mindfulness, secular books that we see perhaps, you know, there's this big emphasis on happiness, right? And mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. I'm going to find my happiness and what's ha- what makes me happy is what's best 
for my life. And and you make a, a careful distinction when we're talking about holy noticing that it's not just this finding this place of you know bliss and happiness. Can you talk to a, a little bit with us about that? Yeah. Well, granted, when we practice this art, and I call it an art of holy noticing, the benefits are reduced anxiety, reduced depression, all kinds of other benefits. So there is an affective, a feeling, uh, a positive feeling that comes from it. But our motivation is ultimately that we become more like Christ. Mm. When we become more like Christ in, in being able to manage our emotions, to be fully present in others, to lead well because we are fully present with those we're leading, it adds a whole new perspective on it versus just, this is all about me and my happiness. So there really is quite a bit of distinction because a lot of the mindfulness you hear about today is about me and my happiness and my peace, right. whereas a motive for a believer is loving God more and loving others more, being present for his work in our lives. And when that happens, well, the byproduct often is affective or emotional peace, but it's not the goal. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I love that. I love that you make that clear because I think that's in, in conversations that I've had personally with people who haven't been super comfortable with the whole idea of mindfulness. That tends to be one of their biggest you know, pushbacks is, um, well, mindfulness, yeah, it, it seems to focus on – it seems to get really, really focused on me and a kind of self-absorbed almost – and and yeah, it's it's it, it talks about having maybe some good uh, byproduct benefits for others, but it it, it becomes this very very kind of almost humanistic, um, right. self absorbed mm-hmm. type of a thing. But you help us walk through this idea of this holy noticing is really as as you said, even in the definition that you've you share with us is this idea that we're, we're looking at. Um, these holy purposes and in holy purposes, as we well know, uh, we're recording this. Uh, incidentally, Charles and I are talking right now. It's Holy Week, and so we're mm-hmm. we're thinking about you know Christ Himself and His walk to the cross and the sacrifice, the mm-hmm. self sacrifice within that. So I love the fact that you make that distinction, Charles, because for me, I know that's personally helpful in really looking at the the bigger picture of why this holy noticing is so important. And the whole idea of like you talk about presence and we're talking about being present, you know, we're thinking of being present with our spouse, with our children, mm-hmm. thinking about being present with, um, you know, the leaders in our church or the people that we're discipling. And and I think in, in so many ways, that's really key, that idea of presence. Right, Charles? Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. You know, I think we can all probably be honest if we kind of evaluate some conversations we've had that when we're talking to somebody, oftentimes our minds float somewhere else or our mind is busy thinking of what um, I'm going to say next. In fact, it just happened to me when you were speaking, my mind went to an image that I saw an hour ago. The cathedral cathedral of Notre Dame is burning Burning, as we speak. And and so my mind went there. It flitted there for about five seconds, and then it came back. And so we have this tendency— just the, the very nature of our minds uh, being distracted so easily that this is kind of something we have to fight against. But as we understand that if I can understand what's going on inside of me, my mind and my emotions, and I can kind of catch that, I can be more present for you. Like you say, the person I'm discipling, the person I'm leading, my my wife, my kids. Right, right. Well, one of the things that you also make clear is that this idea of holy noticing isn't just something that is purely contemplative, but it's something that leads us to action, right? So sometimes, oftentimes people think of mindfulness as being this kind of sitting away somewhere yeah. and, you know, just get, but you make it clear that there is this, you know, it's, it's compelling us to action in some way. Can you talk to us a little bit more about how holy noticing leads us to taking action? Yeah, I actually have an acronym that I use uh, that describes some practices uh, that make up holy noticing. It's the word breathe, and each letter stands for a particular aspect of it. But the last letter, E, stands for the word engage. So really the ultimate reason we do this is so that we might engage the world like Christ did. And of course, look at the life of Jesus. He's the perfect, he's a prototype of what it really means to be a holy noticer. He was there for, he heard the the lepers uh, yelling for for him. He uh, knew the woman who had the, as the, oh, I think the King James says, the issue of blood. She had a disease, a touch his cloak. He 
was there for the marginalized. He was the perfect holy noticer. It wasn't that he just went off into a mountain, which he did a lot to be with his father as part of it, but he lived out this life of noticing those in need. Now, there are actually a couple concepts in when you think of mindfulness. There's the state of mindfulness, and then there's the trait of mindfulness. The state of mindfulness would be what you might do in your in your devotional time. Like when I have my quiet time, I practice this as part of my spiritual disciplines. That's the state of mindfulness. But we don't want it to just be there in our devotional time. We want to make it a trait so that we live this out with those relationships we have during the week, our, our coworkers, our family, people in the church, and those we lead. So it's a state, but it's a trait, and that's the ultimate goal is that it really becomes a trait, a, a lifestyle. As we're looking at that, the idea of it becoming part of a lifestyle, I know um, uh, some of the research you've done and, and what you've written about in Holy Noticing, you, you talk about this idea that we, t- we tend to live in a world where anxieties run high. I mean, that's mm-hmm. just, I mean, we see that, you know, we, I mean, uh, and it, uh, there are lots of reasons for that. We can go into it to a myriad of reasons, but we tend to live in a world where people are more anxious, more stressed. Um, mm-hmm. you, you talk about um, holy noticing as a way that we can practically, um, when we find ourselves in these, these states of, of higher anxiety, that it's something we can actually address. Can you talk to us a little bit? Because I know in ministry, there, there are lots of expectations, there are you know, lots of different mm-hmm. priorities, competing priorities, lots of things going on, uh, a lot of responsibility that we uh, oftentimes put upon ourselves as pastors and ministry leaders, and there can be these anxious moments. So can you talk to us practically about what can we do in those times that can really help us? Mm-hmm. Well, there's a term uh, that uh, psychologists, neuroscientists use, it's called negativity bias. The negativity advice is that in our moments of like reflection or daydreaming, we tend to go negative. In fact, there, a, a large study was done, uh, it's called experience sampling. Basically, it was an iPhone app and people signed up for it and at different times during the day, a text would be sent and they would ask you, how do you feel? What are you doing? And they found out that 50% of the time, our mind wanders. And a large percentage of that time when our mind is wandering, it's wandering to negative things. And I think that's the product of the fall. Mm. And that's why the Apostle Paul said, the word mind was one of his favorite words. He used it over 40 times in his writings. Philippians 4 eight is a key one. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything's excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So he knew, in fact, the, the Apostle Paul was, was the, the neuroscientist before neuroscience ever really was <laughs> because he keenly understood what was going on inside our minds. Right. And so the Holy Spirit had prompted him to write these things. So because of the result of the fall, because of our tendency to do this, there are some things that we can do in those anxious moments. Our, our um, nervous system is our body's wiring system. And part of that nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, has two other systems at work. And I use a metaphor of like a car's brake and a car's accelerator. The accelerator keeps us wired, keeps us anxious. It's called the sympathetic nervous system. Our brake calms things down. It's called the parasympathetic nervous system. And what many research studies have found that practicing mindfulness just during the day, and I'll share a couple of techniques in a moment, can actually turn down the, uh, put, put on that brake in those anxious moments. So there's this evidence-based research that says what the Apostle Paul told us to do. <laughs> and he told us when we pray, God's peace would be yours. Right. And even Isaiah said, you will keep in perfect peace. He moves mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. All these scriptural truths that we know, scientists, science is now catching up. So what I do is in this acronym, B-R-E-A-T-H, I suggest some very simple things that we can do in those anxious moments, but not just in those anxious moments, but as a, as really a uh, as a way of life. That whole trait mindfulness, mm-hmm. and I can touch on a couple of those if you like. For yeah, me I too. would love. I would, okay. Charles. I'd love for you just to walk us through if you could. You bet. Well, the 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 acronym B R E A T H E. I explained what the last letter meant to engage, but b- basically each of these letters represents something we need to check in. Just do a check in. B stands for body, R stands for relationships, E stands for environment, 
A stands for afflictive emotions or affect. Affect is another word for emotions. T stands for thoughts. H stands for heart. So each one of those stands for a particular aspect of mindfulness, holy noticing. And then within each one of those, I have some suggested anchor verses that relate to that and then a practice. So I'll, I'll, I'll suggest one practice under B, body. Okay. Uh, I don't know exactly how old I was. It was probably maybe 15 years ago. My doctor felt like my bones weren't growing properly. He thought maybe I had osteoporosis. And of course, that's the, the women tend to have that when you don't have enough calcium in your system. So he sent me to uh, the x-ray guy, and he did a bone scan. Basically, you lay down this table, they inject radioactive dye into your system, and they run a bone scan. It's just like an x-ray, just from the top of your head all the way to the bottom of your feet, or from your feet to your head. And that lets you look at your bones. And basically, my bones were okay. Well, with that in mind, there's something called a body scan, which is very, very helpful. I used to do this in the morning. Basically, it's imagining like an x-ray going through your body, starting at your left foot, your left leg, uh, your left thigh, your right foot, right leg, your torso, left hand, left arm, right hand. And you just slowly go through and kind of get a sense and sensation of how am I feeling in each parts of my body. And you kind of go all the way through like this body scan did. Now, it does two things for us when we do that. You can do this in your quiet time or you can do it in, a, in a 60 seconds when you're in a moment of anxiety. It lets us know where, we, where we're holding our, our, our stress. My stress is in my shoulders. And I'll often do this in about 30 seconds before I, I preach on Sunday mornings. And I find my shoulders are hunched. And it reminds me, okay, just relax your shoulders. Everything's going to be great. Lord's here. He's going to use you. So it does that. The second thing a body scan does, it, it starts our day with gratefulness. So what I encourage people to do when they do a body scan is they're kind of pretending like this x-rays, you know, kind of going through them. Stop at various parts of your body and thank God for that part. You know, David said in the Psalms, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I know that full well. So uh, I've actually stopped like I've, I've got a, a bum knee. I've had three knee operations. I will stop and I will thank God that my knee is still intact. It still works pretty well. And what scientists have discovered, if you start your day with gratefulness, as this, we already know, the scripture already talks about this a lot. If we start our day with gratefulness, it really sets our day up well. So that's just one little practice that anybody can do in the morning in their quiet time or in a moment of anxiety. And it actually will turn down that sympathetic nervous system and engage your thinking center, centers more where your emotions are less of a controlling factor in the moment. So that's just one of those uh, little tools I suggest. That's so good, Charles. It's fascinating. One of the things I love about the book is you go through um, each of these uh, just very practical ways, you know, these steps, the B-R-E-A-T-H, is that with each of them, and this is just how I'm wired, you have the engage piece. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, you talk about how for each of these, there is the idea of engaging as Christ in our, in our world. So can you talk to us a little bit about, for example, we just talked about um, body, right? What is like the engage piece mm -hmm. um, for body, for example? Um, uh, in Romans, the scripture says, uh, present your bodies to God as a living sacrifice. So part of that little exercise is certainly I'll do the body scan. I thank God for parts of my, of my body, try to find out where my stress is. But as a part of that, I will say, Lord, I yield my body to you in this moment, at this time, for this day as a living sacrifice to you. So there's that um, yieldedness I'm presenting to God. Now, for example, in R, one of the things you do is you look at your relationships, the imagining concentric circles with those closest to you in the inner uh, circle. What I will do and what I encourage people to do is in that part is actually you yield those relationships to the Lord. It may be you're having a really tough time with somebody at work or there's a staff person who's not performing. And, and you know, you got to have that tough conversation. Well, by going through this, the R part, these little concentric circles that I explain in the book, um, Part of the experience of holy noticing is yielding uh, that relationship to the Lord. And then 
when you meet that person, <laughs> when you see that person at work, or you, or you see that person in the room downstairs in your house because it's your teenager, <laughs> your heart is more prepared to engage and be present with that kid, with that staff person in a way that honors God. So each one of these, uh, as part of the little practice, is there's, okay, what am I going to do when I'm out of my prayer closet, so to speak, or out of my devotional time? Yeah, yeah, I absolutely love the way that you tie um, tie that into practical life. And again, it's not just being removed and, and pulled away mm-hmm. and just something we just kind of meditate upon, but it's something that compels us, you know, mm-hmm. into activity, into action. Um, I, th- I think it's, uh, it's one of my, my favorite parts of it as I read through the book, um, because when I first approached the book, honestly, I was thinking in terms of just kind of pulling away from everything. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Which which is an important part of holy noticing, obviously. But I, I I was so encouraged and appreciative of the way Charles that you you take that and you're you're pushing. You know, you're you're showing how we push ourselves back into the world mm-hmm. and engage. So absolutely love it. So body and then relationships you just touched on, and then there's a um a a third one E for environment. And uh, th- this is the third one because you kind of break these into the first three and the last three. The first three are kind of more, you term it, looking up and looking out, kind of more external. Mm-hmm. And the final three are more kind of internal looking in. So mm-hmm. talk to us a little bit about um, what you mean by noticing and engaging your environment. Well, this is one of my f- – when I'm in my place, I usually have my devotional time. It can be one of my most favorite times. This is basically – Developing your attentional skills. And attention is a really important skill as a leader, as a Christian, paying attention to God, mm-hmm. paying attention to your friends, paying attention to your spouse and, and kids, so forth. So what this basically is, I'll often close my eyes and I just listen for sounds. And the winter, when it's cold here in Canada, it'll be that sound of the fan. I'm just paying detailed attention so that I can develop my attention. In the summertime, which is really nice up here, sometimes I'll have my devotional time on the back porch and I would close my eyes, and I would simply listen to the sounds. We have a, a, a forest in our backyard. I listen to the birds. I listen to the wind sweeping through the leaves. And what this does, this naturally leads me to praising God for His, for the, the beauty of His creativity, all the, the marvelous things that He's given us to enjoy uh, what, he, what He's created. Sometimes I'll open my eyes and I'll just look at the the winter, the snow, how it just gently covers the ground, gently covers the trees. So it, it creates a really a, an attitude of worship and praise. Sometimes I'll thank you, Lord. Thank you for gravity. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the ability to just, you know, in, in, uh, breathe the, the air you give us. So what this one does, it really helps us to listen and observe. Well, it's kind of a, a modern day approach of of stop and smell the roses. And this is really important to being able to develop those intentional skills really in all of life. Yeah, that's good. Let, let me push back a little on that, Charles, sure. because mm-hmm. I loved I love um, the scene there in in Canada for you. But what if someone lives um, uh, downtown? Right? And yep. so it's bustling. You know, so whenever they're stopping and trying to take in their environment, it's, you know, an ambulance going by, you know, or horns, you know, it, it just is a lot of almost feels chaotic. Can you walk us through that scenario? Yes. You know, much of life is living in chaos, either external chaos or internal chaos. Mm-hmm. You can even, as as mindfulness, holy notice, it becomes a part of your life, you can still experience by the Spirit of God, God's presence in the moment of a, a chaotic uh, downtown feel. So it's not just that you can only experience this when you can look at the sunset or see the snow or or hear the birds. But it's that you can still observe your environment, even to man-made kinds of things. You're developing your attention. And at the same time, you're learning to be present for the Lord, even though you can have these interruptions. Like sometimes when I'm in the back, uh, back porch, okay, I'm enjoying the birds, and then I hear a siren because we're not too far away from the road and uh, the fire truck's pulling out. So, okay, I hear it, I acknowledge it, and I come back to being present with the Lord. So it's not just for those pleasant scenes when you're right. in the Grand Canyon or the mountains. <laughs> right, right. With the perfect tranquility, you know what I mean? Yes, exactly. Right. It's not just, yeah, right. Yep, that's good. All right. All right, brother. Let's move to these the other three real quick. We can walk through them because this is when we begin to look inward. 
And yes. um, so what is next? So we've got body relationships, environment. So now we move on to A. Stands for affect or afflictive emotions. You know, the reality is we God wired us to experience emotions. Mm -hmm. And emotions are profoundly influential on our decision making, on our leadership, on our spiritual formation. They really are. Right. And what they found out is mindfulness actually has tremendously positive benefits in helping us reduce anxiety, helping us reduce uh, the effects of stress, helping us reduce depression. And they've even found that mindfulness is just as effective or, or more effective than medication. Now, I'm not anti-medication. Some people need medication if their serotonin and uh, dopamine's out of whack. They need those. But learning this uh, ability to sit with even a difficult emotion and being present with it, recognizing that I am not that emotion, I am not that ang anxious emotion, it is real. In fact, there was a, um, a neuroscientist, the last name is Taylor, called, the book is called A Stroke uh, of Genius, uh, A Stroke of Insight. She was a neuroscientist, and she knew she was having a stroke, and she, it's a chronicles her story. And what she says is, you have 90 seconds when an, when an afflictive emotion pops up, you have 90 seconds within which you can choose to just be still and be present with an emotion, and the biophysical uh, results will uh, slowly uh, uh, diminish, or you can engage that and then add more narrative to it, and then the emotion becomes really, really difficult. So A stands for afflictive emotions or affect. T stands for thoughts. And this is, again, this is the Apostle Paul. He talks about being aware of our thoughts and thinking these kinds of things that honor God. He has that list in Philippians 4 8. So that stands for, the T stands for thoughts, being aware of what you're thinking about. The actual technical word is metacognition, thinking about your thoughts, thinking about your thinking. And oftentimes we're in this mental loop and we aren't even aware of what we're thinking about. So that's T. And H stands for your heart. And what I envision is like the Holy Spirit putting a, a searchlight on my heart. Is there sin to confess? Is there something he wants to whisper, whisper to my heart? I'm not saying God talks in an audible voice. I guess he can if he wants to. But he whispers to our heart, maybe prompts us to do something special for our kids, prompts us to initiate a conversation with somebody we're having a difficulty with. So that's what H stands for, stands for heart, doing really, really a heart check in, in the moment. Excellent. Charles, as we're um, as we're talking to pastors and ministry leaders, and um, as as you've shared this uh, holy noticing as a whole, and and kind of walking through the the breathe, the acronym there, um, help those who are listening who haven't yet read the book, and I encourage them to pick up the book, Holy Noticing. But help them. Um, how would you recommend, I guess, a pastor, ministry leader, kind of um, make this a part of their life? Like practically, what does that look like? on a daily basis, for example? Sure. There's a, a term called emotional contagion. And emotional contagion uh, really means that we catch other people's emotions. So we as leaders, whatever we bring to the table to a staff meeting, bring to the office, bring to church on Sunday morning, our, our emotional condition is caught by others, both good and both bad. So we actually have responsibility to steward our emotions. Not that we're going to have a bad day occasionally. You know, and when I'm in my sermon, sometimes I say, guys, you know, I'm just really struggling with this. And so people appreciate that. But if I come to, to work, I'm cranky. I'm ornery. I'm short with people. They catch that. And so I'm actually not only affecting my ability to lead, I'm affecting their ability to lead as well. So I think one of the key things leaders need to realize is that the emotional persona we bring has a profound impact on others and people subconsciously catch those emotions. So as we learn to be more mindful of, for example, our emotions, our thoughts, and learn to submit those to the Lord, change them, be aware of them, not let them control us, we're flat out going to be better leaders. We're going to be more present with people. We're going to be more motivational. We're going to be more encouraging to them because they're catching our spirit of encouragement and optimism and kind of a positive sense rather than being cranky or angry or depressed, anxious, and worried. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good. I love that. Now, as is, is this something that you recommend um, someone like incorporate – into their, you know, maybe their quiet time with God on a daily basis? Or is this something that 
um, occurs maybe throughout the day or both and? How, how does someone kind of start kind of cultivating this? Yeah, for me, I've been doing this for several years, so it's it's both and. I really encourage people, if they want to begin the process, if they want to use this breathe model, which is easy to remember, it's, it's meant to be easy to remember, is start out understanding like what B is. Practice B a minute or two mm. for a week. The next week, do B and then add a minute or two to R. This is my devotional time. This is what I do. I will do a, some mindfulness practice. Then I'll do my scripture reading, and you know, then I'll do some, maybe some praying for specific things. So I incorporate it into uh, my devotional time. And actually, I do it for 20 minutes. I set a timer for 20 minutes. When the timer goes off, I'm done. Then I read scripture. Mm. So for a person starting, start small, one or two minutes with each one, then add them up. And over time, it'll be something like when I miss a couple of days, I really, really miss it. And as you practice it in your daily devotional time, it carries over into your life. And one of the ways that helps me remember it, I use an app called Time Out. I'm on my computer a lot. I write a lot and so forth. It actually, every hour, it dims the screen for maybe three minutes. And that's my cue. Okay, stop what you're doing and have a bit of mindfulness. Have, be still before the Lord. Three minutes later, you can adjust it to two, five, whatever. It's that reminder every hour or so, okay, you need to stop. And it's actually the application of an old uh, practice called stadio, which was the monks, would, when they would stop one task before they go to another, they would pause to mentally and spiritually finish that task before they went to the next. So I, I just need this help like the timeout app. And you can even on your phone, you know, have a beep every hour just to let that be that mental prompt. Okay, stop, be present. Go through a bit of mindfulness, then move on to the rest of your, your day. Yeah, yeah, that, that's super helpful. Thank you, Charles. Charles, this has been such a great conversation, and um, I really want to encourage people, if they've been intrigued by this and, and how, how this can connect and be a part of their kind of spiritual formation, their daily practices as, as a Christ follower and then also as a leader in Christ church, um, the, the book Holy Noticing is available. And, and you guys have a website, holynoticing.com. Where people yep. can mm-hmm. go and you even have some free downloads and some additional yep. resources there. So Holy Noticing is the name of the book. You can go to holynoticing.com. We'll have those links in the show notes for this episode. But Charles, if people want to connect with, with you, are there are there ways that they can connect with you personally? They can sign up when they go to Holy Noticing, a little pop up will come up. Uh, they get a free ebook if they want, and mm-hmm. they, they in doing so they sign up to my blog. And also have my personal blog, Charlestone.com. Uh, twice a week, I send out a couple of blog posts and on, on leadership and spiritual formation. So people can connect me that way. And there's also an email address on, on the website if they want to connect further. Excellent, Charles. Well, brother, thank you so much. I appreciate you making the time to be with us and uh, really, really enjoyed this book. And I encourage people to uh, really take time, especially in you know, uh, in ministry, th- things tend to feel so busy so often. And, uh, you know, it's it's funny. We talk to our, our colleagues, you know, other pastors and ministry leaders and, you know, ask, hey, how are you doing? And oftentimes the response is uh, good, but I'm but busy. Right. And so yes. so this <laughs> yes, that's this right. book is one of those um, one of those gems that helps us, I think, in, in a very God honoring, um, you know, spirit centered way to um, submit ourselves, to yield ourselves, to allow the Spirit of God to do that, that holy work within us so that we can be you know, compelled by the love of God to engage the world around us. So uh, this is a gift um, to us as ministry leaders and as pastors, Charles. So thank you for this. Oh, thanks, Jason. Great being with you. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us on this week's episode. Every week as we are putting the episodes together, we're thinking of you, our pastors and ministry leaders, and striving to provide insightful and inspiring interviews as you seek to grow as a kingdom leader. So we hope you're finding value from the Church Leaders Podcast. And if so, we'd certainly appreciate you taking a few moments to head over to iTunes and leave us a review. Your positive reviews and ratings help other church leaders more easily find our podcasts so they too can benefit from these interviews. Again, we thank you in advance, and if you have any comments, any questions, suggestions, or ideas for guests, I would love to hear from you. You can send me an email to podcast at churchleaders.com, or you can connect with me on Twitter. 
Finally, you can find this podcast as well as other great faith-based podcasts on the Faith Play app. It's available for both Apple and Android. And so we encourage you to check that out as well. So until next time, this is Jason Day encouraging you to love well and lead well. You've been listening to the Church Leaders Podcast. For articles, videos, and free resources that will help you lead better every day, visit our website at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.